Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's USGS public lecture. We are happy you have taken an interest in USGS science. My name is Mitch, and I will be your host and moderator tonight. I do have some quick announcements to make before I introduce our speaker. First off, there will not be a public lecture in December. So please join us in January for Kathleen Springer and Jeff Pagotti, USGS research geologists, talking about evidence of humans in North America during the last glacial maximum. If you are watching this on a desktop computer and need to turn on closed captioning, please look at the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the closed caption icon. It's the one with the two little C's. You can also use the stream text for captioning. Please see the stream text link provided in the question and answer window. If you want to use the question and answer feature, please submit a question at any point during the lecture. Just look for the question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We encourage you to submit questions all throughout the lecture as you think of them. Then at the end of the lecture, we will try to get to all your questions, but depending on how many questions come in, we may not have time to answer every one, but we will do our best. And now it's time to introduce our speaker. Katie Mulliken grew up in Hawaii near the summit of Kilauea Volcano and went to college at the University of Hawaii in Hilo, where she graduated with degrees in geology and anthropology in 2012. Katie moved to Alaska in 2013 to get a master's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and she worked for the Alaska Volcano Observatory for several years before moving back to Hawaii in 2019 to begin work for the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. Haiti lives in Volcano Hawaii, and enjoys hiking in nearby Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and spending time with her family during her free time. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Katie. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks for that introduction and big thank you to you and Amelia for your help um, getting ready for this presentation. So I'm excited to talk to you today. Thank you all for being here. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to tell you about the work that we do at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and how we monitor volcanoes here in Hawaii. Um, we've had a very busy past few years with um, six eruptions at two volcanoes. So jump right in and start off with some background information about Hawaii. So Hawaii is the 50th state. Um, we're the youngest state. We became a state in 1959. And the um, state has eight major islands, but the Hawaiian archipelago is actually over 100 islands spanning over 1,000 miles. So we're the fourth smallest state in terms of land area, but um, actually the fourth, we have the fourth longest coastline of any states. Um, we're the only state not connected to North America, and it actually takes about five and a half hours to get to North America. The closest location is San Francisco, which is about uh, 2,400 miles away. We're also one of the few locations in the U.S. that can grow coffee. So um, we have the right climate to grow coffee. And if you've seen Kona coffee, that's grown here on the Big Island. Our population is one and a half million. So we're the 11th least populous state but the 14th densest, again, because we're such a small state. Um, although most of the islands have beautiful valleys and beaches that probably people are very familiar with and they attract lots of tourists, um, all, the all the islands have volcanic origins. Um, so they're all um, volcanoes, essentially, the tops of volcanoes, most of which are beneath the ocean surface. So this map in the upper right here um, shows the eight main islands. Um, so these up here are Oahu and Kauai. Um, these are largely uh, older volcanoes with eroded valleys. And then um, we have active volcanoes on two islands. Um, and the volcanoes that I'll be talking about a lot today are Mauna Loa and Kilauea. So these are the two, two of the most active volcanoes um, in Hawaii and on Earth. So here's a video from um, just a year ago today. And uh, this was Mauna Loa erupting one year ago um, today. And you can see that there's some vigorous lava fountaining 
um, from several sources and it's feeding these long channelized lava flows that are traveling down slope. Um, in the distance, you can see Mauna Kea, which is another volcano here on the Big Island, um, one that hasn't erupted in um, thousands of years. But why do we have volcanoes here in Hawaii? So um, some of you may be familiar with this, this uh, ring of fire that is a zone around the Pacific that is lined by volcanoes. And those volcanoes um, exist because they're at plate boundaries. So one where one plate is being subducted under another. Um, but Hawaii, as you can see on this map, is in the middle of the Pacific plate. And that is because we are a hotspot volcano. Hotspots are zones of the mantle um, that are hotter and they rise buoyantly and form volcanoes. The hotspots, um, at least the Hawaiian hotspot, is stationary, so it's remained in the same spot, while the Pacific plate is moving slowly in northwest direction um, over the hotspot. And the rate that it moves is about the rate that your um, fingernail grows, your fingernails grow. So it's very slowly moving, um, and it extends all the way to the Aleutians, actually. So we know that this hotspot is very old. Um, so there's a chain of, of very old volcanoes that goes all the way to the Aleutians. Um, the farther the farther away the volcanoes get from the hotspot, the older they are. So we have the youngest um, volcanoes here in Hawaii because we are directly over the hotspot. So um, in this map on the left, you can see that um, you can see that um, the the young volcanoes are on the island. Oops, I think my laser pointer went away. Sorry, let me get that started again. Um, so here on the island of Hawaii are our youngest volcanoes, uh, and that's because we're closest to the hotspot. So here's um, here's a video taken during uh, an eruption of Kilauea volcano this past year, just in June. So we've had several eruptions um, this year at the summit of Kilauea. And you can see that there are several lava fountaining sources within a crater. Um, and again, Kilauea, we're, we're quite close to the hotspot, and that is why we have such um, active volcanoes here on the island of Hawaii. In the background of this video, you can see Mauna Loa volcano. Um, you can see that it's much taller, so it's, it's an older volcano and more mature. It has long, broad flanks. Um, and those are just from the buildup of these fluid lava flows that are our volcanoes here in Hawaii typically erupt. Here's just another view, a low angle view showing the lava fountaining and how it's feeding a lava lake at the base of this crater. And you can also see uh, vigorous plumes of volcanic gas being emitted from these, um, these lava fountaining sources. Oops. So our job here at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is to monitor these volcanoes. Um, and we actually monitor volcanoes in Hawaii as well as in American Samoa. American Samoa is, uh, these islands are also formed from volcanoes uh, that are a result of hotspot vol volcanism, but they're much less active than the volcanoes in Hawaii. So they haven't erupted in American Samoa in over 100 years, but there was an, a very intense earthquake swarm last year in 2022 that a lot of residents felt. Um, and so we've really done a lot of work in American Samoa over the past year, um, establishing connections with the communities there. But our job is to monitor the volcanoes and earthquakes um, and assess their hazards, um, also to conduct research, so look at past deposits, uh, what kind of activity occurred in the past, to better understand what kind of activity could occur in the future. Um, and really the, the most important part of our job is to keep the public and um, officials informed of that activity and what kind of hazards might impact people. So here in Hawaii and in American Samoa, we work very closely with a handful of partners, um, such as the National Park Service, um, the Weather Service in American Samoa, and our, our local emergency management partners. Um, the stars on the map here are the other volcano observatories in the United States. So we work closely with colleagues at these volcano observatories, um, which are the Alaska Volcano Observatory, Cascades Volcano Observatory, California Volcano Observatory, and the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. So particularly during really big events such as the 2018 eruption of Kilauea, which you may have seen about on the news, um, we work very closely with colleagues there. But of all the volcano observatories, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is the oldest in the U.S. So we were founded in 1912, um, nearly 50 years before Hawaii even became a state. 
and we were founded by Dr. Thomas Jagger, who was a um, geologist who was really struck by the damaging effects of volcanic eruptions. Um, and he was inspired to establish a volcano observatory where, where um, methods and techniques to study volcanoes and learn about them could really be refined, all with the intent of protecting people and property from the effects of eruptions. So this upper um, right hand logo here is the, the motto of the um, an association that originally funded the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and it translates as no more shall the cities be destroyed. And this photo in the lower um, left is the, the first volcano observatory, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory structure located on the rim of Kilauea Caldera um, in 1912. And then the photo on the lower right is Thomas Jagger and his wife um, on Mauna Loa during a 1919 eruption there. So he, Thomas Jagger decided to establish the observatory in Hawaii because our volcanoes are very accessible and also frequently erupting. So kind of the perfect laboratory to really refine techniques and um, learn more about volcanoes. It's important to note that prior to HVO's founding, um, there are centuries of volcanic activity documented in Hawaiian oral traditions. So the, in Hawaiian culture, there's a rich um, pantheon of Hawaiian deities that are associated with natural elements. And here in Hawaii, Pele is the deity associated with, um, with lava. And it's no surprise that her home is in um, Kilauea Summit where there are frequent eruptions. Um, this year marks 200 years that we have a written history and written documentation of volcanic eruptions in Hawaii. So Hawaii was contacted relatively recently by Westerners in the late 1700s. And then written documentation of um, activity doesn't begin until 1823 when uh, Reverend William Ellis was the first um, English missionary to visit Hawaii and then um, document eruptive activity. And this um, etching in the lower right should look a little bit familiar because it's kind of the same view as that video that I showed um, just a few slides ago. So here you can see he visited Kilauea when there was activity at the summit. Um, and then in the background is the, the slopes of Mauna Loa again. So when people, I think, hear that we work at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, they maybe think that this is what we're doing every day, um, you know, flying and, and visiting uh, lava flows and taking samples, and that's uh, certainly part of the job, but mm, we have a, a, a large staff and, and really a diverse um, group of people with really different skill sets. So I'll let this video play through, but here you can see that he's taking a scoop of molten lava and he's going to put it in a bucket and then um, pour some water on it. And I should apologize, I removed all the sound from these videos, um, so I'll narrate through them. But I'll also note that all of these videos are available on our website. So if you're interested in seeing them with sound, um, I can drop some links in the chat after this talk. So here's a, a photo of, of our staff today. So we've grown from just one person, Thomas Jagger, over 100 years ago to now about 30 core staff. And really the backbone of, of the observatory are our field engineers and our IT group. So they're the people who are maintaining the remote instrumentation on our volcanoes. Um, that ensures that we can have eyes and ears and monitor these volcanoes remotely. Um, and they're making sure that we're getting the data. So the data is flowing from these instruments back to the observatory. We also have operational staff that help to maintain those networks of instruments and um, analysts that are analyzing the data in real time, as well as research scientists. And I mentioned they're often looking at past events, trying to understand what happened at these volcanoes in the past and what that means for what could occur at the future. Um, and then a handful of other important staff like admin and, and maintenance. Um, and we've had a really uh, intensive volunteer program. So quite a lot of people have volunteered their time here. So now I'd like to talk about eruptions um, here on the island of Hawaii in the past couple of hundred years. And we've talked about Kilauea, and that is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth here. And these colored lava flows are um, you can see the scale bar here in the upper right. They're colored by age um, and lava flows over the past couple hundred years. You can see that three of these volcanoes in Hawaii have erupted um, over the past couple hundred years. So Kilauea is 
frequently erupting. Um, it's erupted dozens of times uh, since the year 1900, and it was erupting continuously from 1983 to 2018 here. All these lava flows in kind of this orangish red color. Um, since 2020, the eruptions have been confined to the summit. So here, this area I'm circling here is the summit region. Um, so we've had five eruptions since 2020. But important to note that geologic mapping shows that this area, this entire area outlined in black here, which is Kilauea Volcano, 90% of it has been covered with lava flows in the past thousand years. So we know that Kilauea um, is very active, um, especially on a geologic time scale. And then here, uh, our neighbor to the north is Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa is the largest active volcano on Earth, and it makes over makes up over 50% of the island of Hawaii. Prior to 1950, Mauna Loa erupted more frequently, so on average every three to five years. But since 1950, Mauna Loa has had much longer periods um, between eruptions. So there's only been a handful of eruptions since 1950. One in 1950, 1975, 1984, and then last year in 2022. And I'll talk about that 2022 eruption a little bit later. Geologic studies show that Mauna Loa um, is also very active and 90% of it has been covered with lava flows in the past 4,000 years. And then lastly, we have Hualalai here. Um, and Hualalai erupts less frequently. Um, it hasn't erupted in, in a couple of hundred years. So the last most recent eruption was in 1801. But in 1929, there was a really intense earthquake swarm there that caused quite a lot of damage and um, was probably magma moving up towards the surface, but never making it to the surface to the erupt. So now looking at the same map, and what I've done is overlaying roads on the island of Hawaii. And of course, when we monitor our volcanoes and you know are interested in learning about their behavior, but all with the intent of better understanding um, what kind of hazards they might pose to people, especially people living on the flanks of these very active volcanoes. So looking at over the past 100 years of activity and how it's impacted people, for Kilauea, there have been over 1,000 structures destroyed by um, lava flows, and most of those occurred during the destructive 2018 eruption that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then there were also at least a couple hundred of uh, structures destroyed during the, that 1983 to 2018 eruption that I'm circling here. Also over 35 miles of road covered. Um, and then several deaths, at least one directly related to volcanic activity at the summit of Kilauea, and that was from an explosive block that um, impacted a person. And then several other deaths related to the lava flow fields here, um, kind of indirectly. For Mauna Loa, again, it, it's not been as active over the, the time period since 1950, but prior to that, it was much more active. And um, over the past 100 years, it has destroyed at least 20 structures. Um, and crossed roads uh, with, with several miles of road, co road covered. Importantly, the slopes of Mauna Loa here are very steep. So if eruptions start on the flanks here, they can generate lava flows that flow down slope and can cross major highways and reach the ocean in just a matter of hours. So this is an area, a high hazard area, that's of great concern for Mauna Loa. And here you can see there's a community that's located in an area that can be impacted by lava flows relatively quickly. Um, so with continued growth on the island of Hawaii, these are areas of concern. Um, and our concern will only continue to grow as the population continues to grow. Lava flows aren't the only hazard of concern in Hawaii though, um, and there are secondary hazards associated with lava flows. So they can generate fires when they enter the ocean. They can also generate these hazardous plumes of material. When volcanic eruptions occur, there's increased volcanic gas emissions, and that can cause volcanic air pollution, especially in communities downwind. While our, our volcanoes are known for generating effusive lava flows, um, they can also erupt explosively. So I mentioned a man being killed um, in a 1924 explosive eruption, and this is a photo of a block that was ejected out of the, the summit of the volcano during that eruption. Um, we also get damaging earthquakes. We're a very seismically active region, and associated with that, we can get ground fractures, ground subsidence, and local tsunamis, which can impact people. And this photo um, in the upper right is a photo from 1975. So there was a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake that caused local ground subsidence along the coast. 
and a local tsunami that killed um, a couple of people. So these are some of the other hazards that we are concerned with um, when we monitor our volcanoes. So here are some examples of the monitoring stations that are placed across the surface of the volcanoes um, that we use to detect activity. Um, and we're really looking for changes. So here we have in the upper right a photo of a, a GPS station, and this operates very much like the GPS in your car or your phone where um, it's recording uh, the coordinates of a location, but the, the GPS that we use are in a fixed location, and we're looking at how that specific location might be changing, um, moving, so moving up or down or even north, east, west. Um, and then we also use an extensive network of earthquake detecting devices. So these are called seismic stations, and um, the photo on the lower right is a, an image of that. Um, tilt is another method of looking at ground deformation, and we're concerned with ground deformation because it can indicate whether or not there's magma accumulating beneath the ground surface or moving beneath the ground surface. We also have volcanic gas um, stations that measure that, um, and a number of other um, techniques, some of which I'll talk about later, but just to give you an idea of what these stations look like. And here's a map of, of what those stations, um, the distribution of those stations across the island, and you can see that the most dense locations are on the two most active volcanoes that we've been talking about. So Kilauea here and then Mauna Loa here. But then there are stations distributed across the island as well as other islands. And these instruments work together as a network to really give us an idea of how the volcano as a whole is behave behaving. And again, what we're looking for is changes. And the two most um, common questions that that we get is when and where an eruption might happen. Um, and these are difficult things to answer. We can't say when exactly an eruption will occur, but what we can say is that patterns of unrest, um, and unrest is increased earthquake activity or ground deformation, so changes in how the ground is behaving. Um, those occur over periods of weeks to months before an eruption might occur. And Really, we only know that an eruption is going to occur about an hour before, and we start to see a signal indicative of magma moving to the surface. And as it does that, it's breaking rock up and many tiny, tiny earthquakes are occurring. So the plots um, here, and I'm sorry they're so small, but this is showing four years of data. And this top panel is showing the numbers of earthquakes occurring over time. And you can see these black bars, the taller they are, the more earthquakes are occurring. And then these yellow dotted lines mark when eruptions occur. And so you can see that over a period of four years, um, there's generally increasing earthquake numbers occurring, and then an eruption happens. And then the pattern repeats. It might get quiet after an eruption, and then the numbers of earthquakes start to increase another eruption. The panel on the bottom is showing ground tilt. So this is um, something that we use as a proxy for kind of understanding how pressurized the magma system is. Um, and the blue line as it goes up is indicating increased ground tilt. And it works um, kind of in junction with, with the earthquake counts. They together reinforce this message that the volcano is becoming pressurized. So you can see just like the earthquake counts increase before an eruption, here on the bottom panel, the ground tilt increases and an eruption occurs, we might get subsidence, and then again, it begins to increase along with the earthquake counts before an eruption. And here I wanna just point out that this, the end of this plot is just the past few months here at the summit of Kilauea. And you can see that we're having increased earthquake counts as well as ground tilt. So we're in this period of building unrest and our messaging, we've been working really closely with the, our partners at the National Park Service who manage the land of Kilauea Summit and messaging that, yes, this system is, is showing that it's becoming pressurized and an eruption could occur with relatively little notice. And this map on the, on the um, right hand side here is showing the earthquake locations over the past month. Um, so these orange dots of different sizes are earthquakes of different magnitudes. And here's the summit here. Um, and you can see that uh, we've had quite a lot of earthquake activity.
I wanted to point out that a lot of this monitor monitoring data is available on our website. So this is a really great resource for people if, you, if you're interested in learning about volcanic activity or keeping an eye on, on volcanic activity here in Hawaii. So here on our, our homepage, we have a monitoring map, and I think the default display shows earthquakes over the past couple days. So you can see here some orange dots indicating that we've had some earthquakes on Kilauea. And then if you zoom in on that map using there are these plus and minus signs on the left hand side. If you zoom in to, for example, Kilauea summit area here and then use the right hand um, panel to display our instruments, you can see our monitoring instruments, um, their distribution across the landscape. So here I have some of the the um, monitoring tools that we talked about a few slides ago, so GPS and tilt meters. And then if you click on an individual instrument, you can see the data from it. So here we have a seismic station showing some earthquakes occurring over um, a 12 hour period and then appear a webcam image. So a lot of great resources are available on our website. Another thing we have are specific web pages that compile monitoring observations over past timeframes. So here I've just pulled some examples of monitoring data um, over the past month for Mauna Loa. And you can see there's a map showing all the earthquakes that occurred over the past month and then some plots showing that we had a little bit of increase in the numbers of earthquakes. So this is just like the plot I showed on the slide a few slides ago. Um, we had a little bit of an increase in um, late October, early November, but since then we've had less um, earthquakes. So a lot of great resources and definitely recommend you check out our website. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, eruptions that we've had. So thanks for your patience and letting me talk about some of the monitoring techniques and HVO um, kind of mission. But in order to talk about the recent eruptions at Kilauea, I have to take a few steps back and talk about what happened in 2018. So this was the largest um, lower east rift zone eruption and uh, summit collapse in 2000 years, or sorry, oh my goodness, 200 years, sorry about that. Um, and it was the most destructive over the same, same time period. So really um, devastating to local communities and over 700 homes were destroyed. So here you can see this, um, outline of the 2018 lava flows in red and then uh, roads are overlain here and you can see there are large uh, subdivisions that were really impacted by this eruption. A very large amount of lava was erupted during this eruption and it occurred low on the flank of the volcano over a period of about three months. So as that was occurring up at the summit there was so much magma being erupted lower on the flank of the volcano that the summit began to collapse. So the main magma storage system is beneath the summit, and because it was being drained, the floor of the caldera was not being supported, and it eventually began to collapse in on itself. So this time-lapse video taken over um, a period of several months during that eruption shows that caldera collapse. And so you can see the floor of the caldera um, slowly subside, and then plumes of rock fall debris, and eventually um, that activity stops around the same time that the eruption stops. That activity essentially left us with a very deep hole at the summit of Kilauea, a deep crater. Um, and at that time, the collapse was so deep that um, groundwater actually started to appear. So this is an animated GIF showing images over um, a period of several years collected. And you can see this deep pit that we had at, in 2018 um, and a, a water lake appears and then once we start to have eruptions, that hole is being filled. So essentially, um, since 2020, we've been in a period of crater filling eruptions. All of these eruptions have occurred at the summit and they're filling in that that pit, that deep collapsed pit that formed in 2018. And I, I also want to note that um, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk Native Hawaiian oral traditions and how they can document volcanic activity and there are some Native Hawaiian oral traditions that mention Pele, so she's that deity that whose home is the summit of Kilauea, and she's associated with lava. And there are oral traditions that talk about her um, being threatened by water in the past. And so now, seeing this recent activity, we can infer that Native Hawaiians in past centuries witnessed some kind of similar caldera collapse, where there was perhaps water at the summit of Kilauea, and it in their eyes impacted Pele. Um, so we know that this kind of activity may have occurred in the past. So over the past, um, yeah, 
uh, three years, we've had five eruptions, and this video is from that first eruption, and you can see that there are vents in the wall of this crater spewing lava um, down into the bottom of the crater and generating a lava lake. So um, these eruptions have ranged in duration from about a week to over a year. The most recent eruption was only one week long, um, and here this clip is from that first eruption just a few weeks into it, and you can see that it's already filled much of the crater. And actually the next clip, this is from the most recent eruption, so just in September of this year, and you can get a sense of how much of that crater has been filled with lava and, and how much uh, of the crater floor, caldera floor, is covered with lava right now. Um, we're fortunate in that these recent eruptions have been confined to the summit caldera, so they haven't threatened any infrastructure. Um, the main hazard has been the volcanic gases and and that causing some vog or volcanic air pollution for communities downwind. So if people often see those footage of, of that lava lake at the summit of Kilauea and lava flows, and they wonder if lava is going to overtop the caldera. But actually looking at the volume of the collapse that happened in 2018 and comparing it to the volume of lava that has erupted since then, only about 25% of the, the um, caldera that collapsed in 2018 has been filled with lava. So here this panel on the bottom is um, a series of cross sections. So the yellow line is the caldera before the collapse in 2018. The black line is the caldera after the collapse. And here you can see that deep pit that we saw in the animated GIF a few slides ago. Um, the blue line is the water lake that was present briefly. And then the other lines, subsequent lines are um, marking how much certain eruptions filled the caldera floor. Um, so here you can see that the first eruption is this purple line and then subsequent eruptions are these um, lines closer to the top. But this area, this whole area here that collapsed in 2018 has yet to be filled. So right now the um, new lava flows cover an area of about 500 acres or just under one square mile of the crater floor. Um, and here these are outlined in pink on the map here, um, and they filled a depth of over 1,200 feet of lava in the, the caldera, which is really impressive. Um, if you've been to New York City and seen the Empire State Building, that's more depth of lava than the Empire State Building is tall. And uh, also in terms of volume, 54 billion gallons of lava have been erupted. So if you can picture 54 billion gallons of uh, jugs of milk, <laughs> or um, that's actually equivalent to about 80,000 Olympic swimming pools um, or about a third of the Sydney Harbor. So quite an impressive amount of lava. So here's a video compilation from the most recent eruption. And um, this eruption has followed patterns exhibited by the previous eruptions as well, where initially we might have several fountaining sources. Um, and as the eruption progresses, those fountaining sources, some of them might die out and eventually the eruption becomes centralized at one or two vents. Um, typically in the first day or couple days of the eruption, the, the rate of lava being erupted is generally quite high. And then as the eruption progresses, that eruption rate decreases. Um, this most recent eruption in September was interesting because we had a series of fissures that cross cut the caldera floor. And in this video, you can see one of them actually cut into the caldera wall. And um, so you can see lava kind of dribbling down the, the rubble that formed during the 2018 collapse in this video here. And then feeding lava flows that are flowing into the uh, lava lake um, located in the center, center part of the crater. Um, so these eruptions have created new topography at the base of the crater, and here you can see several vents that are fountaining and they're building up these um, these features, these cinder spatter features around the cone. And in this video in particular, you can see how the lava fountaining constructs these, these features as lava spills over the top and then cools onto that solidified surface. Um, these features were up to about 20 meters tall, and also this most recent eruption, we were fortunate in that enough of the crater floor had been filled that we could actually get to the area where the eruption was occurring and accessing it. So that video I showed earlier of the lava sample being taken, um, that was one of the first times we've been able to take a lava sample in the past 
five years just because the other eruptions were occurring so deep within the crater um, that they were relatively inaccessible um, for us. So that's um, kind of a summary of the recent Kilauea eruptions. And now I'll talk briefly about um, the Mauna Loa eruption last year. So this was a significant event because it was the first time that Mauna Loa erupted in nearly 40 years. So it had been a long time. Um, and we were fortunate in that we had several months of increased unrest before the eruption. So just like those those plots I showed of increased earthquake counts and ground deformation indicating a pressurizing magma system, we were seeing similar signals for Mauna Loa, and that allowed us to go into the communities and really um, emphasize preparedness and awareness. So make sure that people were aware of this increased activity and the fact that a, an eruption could occur with relatively little notice, and then emphasize preparedness. So think about, you know, if you lived here on the slopes of Mauna Loa, think about what that might mean for your commute, because many people living here have to commute to this area for work. Um, but fortunately, the eruption didn't, the lava flows didn't travel in that direction. So you can see here they traveled primarily in a kind of a north northeast direction. And this area um, of Mauna Loa is not heavily developed, so relatively low impact. Um, the white lines here again are roads, and you can see this is a um, weather observatory access road. So these lava flows last year did cross the weather observatory access road, um, and they did encroach upon a major highway. So this is um, the Daniel K. Inouye Highway, um, and lava flows got to within two miles of it, but fortunately the eruption stalled before the um, lava flows got too close. So we were really fortunate. Overall, um, there was a question as to whether or not it had been so long since Mauna Loa erupted, um, you know, nearly 40 years. So there were, we were wondering if perhaps the next eruption might be really big. But looking at this recent eruption and comparing it to past eruptions, um, basically it was a pretty average Mauna Loa eruption, fortunately. So it lasted about 12 days. And here you can see this vent is, is active high up on the flanks. The, the vent locations were at an elevation of about 11,500 feet. So it was a pretty remote location. And they generated lava flows that traveled about 12 miles from the vent source to that most distal location that was encroaching upon the highway. Um, they covered an area of about 16 and a half square miles and erupted about comparable amount of lava to what we've seen um, at Kilauea over the past five eruptions. So again, uh, about equivalent to 80,000 Olympic swimming uh, pools. And here's some shots showing the um, the distal flow front, which you can see from these videos that the, the uh, lava flows become channelized high up on the, um, the slopes of the mountain where the slopes are steeper. And then um, where the, the ground slope levels out, they might fan out and form those wide flow fronts. Um, here, this video is showing one of our staff deploying a webcam to monitor the eruption. So webcams, I'll talk about them a little bit later, but they were are really um, a wonderful tool that we use um, for eruption monitoring and also really engaging for um, the public and for the community because we can offer the webcam images on our website. And these are solar powered here. And then this is a clip of a geologist making some observations. Um, so this eruption, as I mentioned, it occurred really high on the flanks of the volcano um, in an area that was relatively difficult to access, so helicopter access only. Um, but we were fortunate in that we were able to get out there most of the, the days during the eruption to make observations. Um, there were only a couple days where the weather prevented us from, from visiting. And here's um, a shot of the flow front. So this is an AA flow front, and you can see um, well, I guess there isn't a sense of scale, but this is probably about as high as a person is tall, so five or six feet tall here. So now I thought I'd talk about some of the, um, the tools that have been really useful for monitoring these eruptions, and one of them, as I mentioned, is webcams. So we have a few different categories of webcams that we use. One is permanent telemeter web cameras, so that means that they are always fixed in their location and they're sending us images, remote images all the time. Um, 
A subset of that is our live stream cameras. So these have been really popular during Mauna Loa. We were able to, to deploy one live stream camera um, that's since been taken down. And then at Kilauea, we have also a live stream camera. Um, so if you went to the USGS YouTube channel right now, you can check that out and you would just see a, probably a very rainy landscape because we've been having a lot of rain right now. Um, at Kilauea Summit, the live stream camera is actually, it's a, called a PTZ or a pan tilt zoom camera. So that's the photo in the lower right here. And this is really incredibly useful because we can control the, the camera view. So the caldera is fairly large and activity, eruptive activity has really um, ranged in location over the past few years. And so using this pan tilt zoom allows us to really be able to view that activity no matter where it occurs. During eruptions, we deploy additional web cameras. Um, and for example, during Mauna Loa, we deployed seven, seven cameras from the vent locations down the lava channels to the flow front. And um, in particular, the, the flow front ones were useful for evaluating the, the flow front as it encroached on the highway and also the vent ones for evaluating changes in, in eruption rate or eruption dynamics there. We also deploy time lapse ca uh, cameras, which aren't always telemetered. Um, so they're, they might be out on the landscape collecting images, but then we have to visit them and get the cards and get the data. And these can be really useful for looking at changes over time. So this animated GIF here is showing um, Kilauea caldera, and you can see this is during an eruption, so lava flows are paving the area in the foreground. But the um, time lapse also shows that over time, the whole crater floor is lifting. So this was telling us that the um, the crater was being supplied with lava underneath the crust, as well as lava being erupted on the surface. Um, and then this next video is a webcam image or video of uh, of one of the eruption starts being captured. And so I mentioned um, when I was talking about the monitoring data that we can see signals of an imminent eruption about an hour before. And when we do see those, we usually put out a notice and we might change we, we do change the alert level of the volcano to inform the partners and the public that this volcano is looking like it's likely to erupt. Um, so when we do that, you know, we're watching the webcams to see when lava breaks the surface, but because we have our webcam imagery and our live streams available online, it also allows people to watch. So we've heard from, from others, you know, members of the public that when we put out an alert level change, they hop onto our live streams and watch and are able to see witness an eruption start um, at the same time that we do, which is pretty great. I also wanted to mention our mapping efforts because these are um, also, we've, we've really refined these over the past um, several eruptions and we use um, helicopter-based imagery, but also uh, UAS or drone-based imagery. Um, both visual and thermal. And the thermal can be very useful because it can see through through fumes. So look at temperature changes. Um, and when we do these kinds of aerial surveys during an eruption, we're collecting um, geospatially tagged images that can then be um, stitched together to create a three-dimensional model. And so that can be useful for looking at changes in, in volumes or changes in topography. Um, looking at yeah changes through time during an eruption. And then also using drones, we collect um, nadir imagery. So that's just imagery that's fixed in one location. And I'll show an example of that shortly. Um, but that can be useful for looking at effusion rates. So how much lava is being erupted over a certain period of time and changes in effusion rates over time during an eruption. And importantly, that uh, data can also be supplied to our emergency management partners in near real time. So the upper right corner here is a map um, showing an example of that during Mauna Loa. So we were able to provide this mapping data um, to our local civil defense agency, and then they provided it on their website. And we've heard from the public that this was really useful for them during the eruption because they might hear, have heard, um, misinformation being shared online about you know changes in the eruption location or lava the lava flow crossing the highway and they could go to this website and and this official trusted source of information and see you know based on the mapping that no that wasn't the case and so identify misinformation and then another product example is on the left so this is a animated gif compilation showing thermal maps so these maps are showing temperatures um, over time during an eruption and you can see that when the eruption starts, the cooler, the um, warmer temperatures rather, which are the yellows and the reds, 
um, are flooding much of the crater floor. So a lot of active lava flooding the crater floor. And as the eruption progresses, you're getting more of those cooler temperatures, um, the blues that are indicating that much of the crater floor is, is cooled lava and the active area is much smaller. So this is a really useful tool as well. Um, and then on the bottom, I've already talked about this, but the these profiles um, are also derived from that these aerial mapping techniques. So really useful tools for um, communicating and also evaluating um, eruptions over time. So I mentioned the um, effusion rate estimates, and these are derived from videos. So this is an example of that from Mauna Loa. And in this video, the, a drone is capturing this video. The drone is hovering in a fixed location over this lava channel. Um, and we have a rough approximation of the lava channel um, uh, dimensions. And by measuring the, the rate that these um, pieces of crust are moving, we can get an estimate of how much lava is being erupted over time. So um, that's a, a piece of rafted lava crust that's floating down um, being transported down this lava channel during Mauna Loa. And they're also just really spectacular videos. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, I just want to say that we've been really fortunate that the recent eruptions over the past several years at both Kilauea and Mauna Loa have had minimal impacts. Um, and they've been really great opportunities for the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory to strengthen our, our partner relationships and our communication efforts and techniques with our partners, but also the public here on the island of Hawaii and the wider public that are really interested in learning about volcanoes. Um, and also for our, ourselves, our response activities. So whether it's mapping techniques or deploying instrumentation um, and yeah, just really allows us to strengthen those efforts. Um, we're really fortunate that we live in a place that the, the is so dynamic. So the landscape is changing on a scale of, of days, sometimes even hours. And um, we're lucky that we have the opportunity to really measure those changes and learn from them. So yeah, I thank you all for being here today and I really encourage you to check out our website. We have a lot of resources available on the website. And um, Mitch mentioned our, our email address. Um, we're also on social media and um, I mentioned briefly our alert level system, and you can actually sign up to receive notifications of volcano alert level changes or notices of volcanic activity through our volcano notification service. Um, so if you're interested, we that's something that we encourage residents here in Hawaii to um, subscribe to. So thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here today and letting me share some of our observations of recent eruptions in Hawaii and our monitoring te techniques, and happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Katie, that was great. Um, we do have questions coming in. And just before we begin the Q&A session, just want to remind people that if they would like to submit a question, please go ahead and click on the Q&A uh, little Q&A bot um, button and send us a question. Uh, we will try to get to all of them, um, but please be aware that we may get too many questions to answer in the period of time we have here. So, but, and we are getting a bunch of questions. So let me just go ahead and start. Um, see, the first question is, are there any videos showing ground deformation over time? If so, how is it useful? Yeah, so I showed that video of um, the time lapse um, video showing the rise of the crater floor. So that's an example of um, ground deformation over time. Um, and it can tell us about the processes that are occurring. So that was really a localized ground deformation and basically allowed us to learn that although lava flows were paving the surface of the crater floor, there was also magma being supplied underneath the solidified surface um, and causing that surface to rise. So um, really helpful to understand what was occurring, processes that we couldn't actually see, but we could see the result of, of lava being supplied underneath the surface. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, you answered it for me. Um. <laughs> In prior Volcano Watch articles, it mentions something like the Pali is pulling away from the island of Hawaii. Can you explain that, like what is causing it and what could happen in the long term? 
Ah, OK, so yeah, first um, kudos for knowing Volcano Watch. Um, so Volcano Watch is an article, weekly article that the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory publishes, and you can um, view that on our website or you can also subscribe to receive that in, in your email. So um, definitely recommend people check out that if they're interested. But um, it sounds like they're talking about the Pali, which are um, Pali is a word for cliff in Hawaiian. And on the south flank of Kilauea, there are a series of Pali's. And they do mark um, basically that the south flank of Kilauea is moving. So I mentioned the Pacific plate moving in a northwest direction, but actually the south flank of Kilauea is moving in the opposite direction. So you get these faults that form. And um, they, you know, there, there's um, our GPS network shows that there can be kind of continual slow movement. And then also during large earthquakes, there can be more abrupt movement. So during 2018, for example, during that eruption, there was um, a large earthquake and magma was intruding down the rift zone um, into the volcano. And so there was some forced movement essentially. And so the pulleys can form, yeah, kind of slowly over time, but also during these larger earthquakes. Um, and some of the other volcanoes in Hawaii um, do show signs of larger landslides that can occur, so so larger collapses, but those haven't been observed in modern history. I think the, the most recent date was maybe over 100,000 years, so they're not well understood, these larger collapses. Okay, um, question from Oscar. Is there usually a gap in time from the peak of earthquakes to when an eruption occurs? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, interestingly, at Mauna Loa, we did see that the earthquake activity was building um, over you know three months or so prior to the eruption, but in the maybe, I'd have to go back and look, but at least a week, a couple weeks before the eruption, the earthquake activity was actually decreased. So yeah, that can happen sometimes. Um, I'm not sure why. A uh, uh, question from Eric. Why would the crater be filling as opposed to the lava escaping lower down along the flanks? Yeah, um, I think that's a really good question and I'm not sure that we have a good answer for it. Um, we do know that in 2018, um, the volcano obviously experienced some kind of restructuring beneath the surface um, with the big caldera collapse event. Um, but it's not looking at the history of Kilauea. So we, we have, you know, 200 years of observations. And during the 1800s, um, Kilauea's behavior was actually probably more similar to what we're seeing today. So kind of sustained or semi-sustained summit eruptive activity um, with rare flank um, activity. And so maybe what we're seeing is that Kilauea has these patterns of larger flank eruptions, potentially some summit collapse associated with that. And then in the decades after that, some summit refilling. So, you know, geologically, we have a very small time frame um, uh, that we're, we've observed Kilauea's behavior um, and maybe we're seeing some patterns, um, but I think we're still learning and maybe this, interplay between flank eruptions and then summit refilling is is one of those patterns. So we're we're still learning. <laughs> and I will I should also note that out, out of 2018, um, we were the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory received supplemental funding to do more extensive studies to better understand Kilauea volcano. And one of the things that um, was done was this extensive um, active seismic study where a bunch of, of earthquake detecting devices were located across the caldera region and recorded earthquakes over a period of a couple of months. And then during that time frame, a truck was driving around and generating um, seismic signals that would travel into the ground and be refracted and then recorded by these, um, these seismic instruments. And so um, that was just done this past summer, and that will help to paint a picture of what kind of magma storage bodies are underneath Kilauea and how they might be connected to the flanks. And that will really help us understand um, more about why Kilauea behaves the way it does. So forthcoming studies. <laughs> always, always new things to learn. A uh, question from Steve asks, uh, what about INSAR monitoring for long-term changes? 
Yeah, yep, that's definitely something that we do. Um, so just recently at the summit, kind of in the summit and upper southwest rift zone of Kilauea, we've been seeing um, a lot of earthquake activity and INSAR has been one of the most useful tools to also look at ground deformation. So um, INSAR is uh, over, I think, longer time frames, so periods of weeks, um, but it can really supplement the the um, observations that our, our ground based instrumentation can observe. So, for example, in the Kilauea summit kind of southwest region over the past couple months, there's been um, all those earthquakes. And then the INSAR imagery has also shown uh, an area of about at least 10 centimeters of uplift. So we're seeing definitely that that area, there is some magma coming into it um, and causing yeah ground deformation uplift. OK, a question from Cheyenne says hello with so much lava coming up to the surface is there a study showing where else in the area or anywhere else that that volume is compensated since nothing is created everything is transformed i wonder if there's a collapse in the bottom of the ocean or around the island oh oh interesting yeah um no i don't think so because so um uh, beneath Kilauea's summit is the main kind of magma storage system where uh, we think it's getting supplied from the hot spot. So this is, um, it's it's different from like 2018 where there was a flank eruption of lava that drained the magma chamber. In this case, the, the summit um, eruptions are erupting um, and are being supplied by the hot spot. So um, no, we're not seeing any kind of subsidence or anything like that um, elsewhere. But typically, if there are flank eruptions, there can be some summit, um, summit, uh, yeah, those those signals of subsidence or even um, brittle collapse uh, associated with larger events. And that's something that was observed um, during past eruptions as well. So um, eruptions lower on the flank in the 50s and 60s. Um, Sometimes they would see the caldera floor sag. Um, and then in 2018, of course, we saw it sag and then collapse. Right. OK, a um, uh, question from Anonymous is what type of an, what kind of an analysis are geologists doing with the lava samples? What type yeah, of information are they looking for? That's a good question, and I should have talked about it during the lava sampling video, but they're um, the reason that he poured water on it to, was to quench it. So he didn't um, typically you don't want um, you want to to try and preserve the magma chemistry and you do that by rapidly cooling it. And then we have a partnership with the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, they have some analytical instrumentation where we can basically collect a lava sample in the morning and then um, the University of Hawaii at Hilo can have it a bulk chemistry um, analyzed by later in that same day. And for recent Kilauea summit eruptions, um, we haven't seen any really changes in chemistry, but changes in chemistry, um, it's important to, to chemically analyze rock samples, lava samples, because you can see changes in chemistry. So during 2018, that eruption, for example, um, they were analyzing samples every day. And initially, um, the, the lava being erupted didn't travel very far from where it was being erupted. And the chemistry showed that it was older magma that had been stored beneath the ground surface for decades. Um, so it had time to cool and as lava flows cool, they grow crystals and they become very sticky. So then by the time it erupted on the surface, the lava flows weren't traveling very far because they weren't as hot and fluid. But basically they were you know, taking samples every day during that eruption and able to see the chemistry slowly change um, and become more indicative of hotter, more fluid lava arriving um, being transported underground from the summit to the eruption site. And then associated with that chemical change was a change in behavior. So those lava flows, while they originally or initially didn't travel very far from the vents, as that hotter, more fluid, um, chemically younger lava flows arrived, they were traveling much farther from the vent. And those were the really destructive lava flows that destroyed um, most of the houses. And so yeah, we're monitoring for for chemistry because that can give some indication of um, the behavior. OK. Um, more of a comment than anything else was great images and video. Thank you for the lecture. Very informative. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, from Eric is what is the ultimate heat source melting the rocks? 
I can think of paleo heat from the formation of the Earth and decay of radioactive elements in Earth's interior. Are both of these important heat sources today? Are there any other sources? Yeah, I mean, the, the hotspots, I'm not sure that hotspots are um, very well understood, um, but yeah, it's, it's all related to this this hotter zone in the mantle, um, and that, that zone is hotter than the surrounding mantle, so it's, it's more buoyant and wants to rise. Um, ultimately, I'm not sure why certain, and I'm not sure if, if we do understand why um, hotspots, specific hotspots exist. Um, and their longevity. So the Hawaiian hotspot is at least 80 million years old because there's the chain of, of Hawaiian, um, of volcanoes that formed from the Hawaiian hotspot extends all the way to the Aleutians. So um, it's really long lived and other hotspots are, for example, Iceland or Yellowstone. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if we really fully understand them. Probably everything that he mentioned is correct or he or she, but maybe not well understood. Right. OK, question from Tim. Was the temporary water lake that formed within Kilauea's crater from rainwater or groundwater? It was from groundwater, so um, the collapse was deep enough that the, the groundwater system was rebounding um, and creating this lake. So we actually saw it rise um, over time um, and it existed for, let's see, just over a year, I think it was. Yeah, just over a year. So really, um, unprecedented in, in observed history, and that was a really exciting time. Very difficult to sample because it was so deep in that collapse pit, but we did, we were able to send a drone down and do some chemical sampling. So they were kind of tracking whether or not the chemistry of that water was changing to maybe indicate whether or not we had magma um, encroaching and becoming close to the surface. And, and I think we collected three samples and there wasn't really an obvious change in chemistry, despite the fact that lava was clearly, or magma was clearly um, getting close to the surface. <laughs> okay, um, question from Fiona. How do eruptions affect native wildlife populations? Are the areas surrounding volcano, or are vol the areas surrounding volcanoes uninhabited by Hawaii's wildlife? Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. And it has, um, I think, at least in terms of regrowth on lava flows, it has a lot to do with rainfall. So um, uh, our island, we have a, a really rainy side and then we have a dry side. And on the rainy side, we can get regrowth relatively quickly. Um, whereas on the dry side, it, it's pretty slow. But in terms of um, how wildlife reacts to eruptions themselves, um, you know, our lava flows are typically pretty slow moving. So um, whether if it's an animal, they can usually outrun it. Um, and then in terms of for the plants, um, some of the native species here have adaptations that are um, actually make them even ideal for existing in a volcanic environment. So one of the native trees, I'm not a plant person, but it's something like some aspect that they can close when they're in a, a, a very an environment that has a lot of volcanic gas. So um, interestingly, yeah, maybe some adaptation to the, the volcanic environment here. Okay, um, this is from Anonymous. Thank you for an enthusiastic and interesting presentation. <laughs> Thank USGS for your important work in communicating the significance of science to the public and politicians. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, another question from Eric. Um, do volcanoes typically use existing subterranean plumbing systems? Mm. Or are they often creating new pathways on human timescales? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, uh, probably a bit of both. So the magma storage system beneath Kilauea is um, likely very long lived. Um, and I don't think we've seen any major changes in that, um, at least in in modern monitoring history, but so those are the main, you know, bulk of the magma storage system. When individual eruptions occur, new pathway, new pathways are definitely established. So in 2018, for example, when that um, lower east rift zone eruption happened low on the flank of the volcano, we saw um, earthquakes basically moving um, down 
it's hard to explain, within the volcano down the flank um, as the magma established its path there. And then um, I mentioned there was a large earthquake, so that earthquake was probably accommodating some of the stress that was built, built as that magma was forcefully intruding a path. So definitely a combination of um, existing storage bodies, but then branching from those existing storage bodies are um, new pathways established as new eruptions occur. But I will say that our volcanoes also have, I've mentioned rift zones and I didn't explain them, so I'm sorry about that, but the rift zones are um, basically zones of weakness where eruptions are most likely to occur. So Kilauea has two of them, the east rift zone, and, and it extends from the summit down to that area where that um, 2018 eruption occurred. And then there's another one extending to the southwest. Um, and then Mauna Loa also has two extensive rift zones. So there are kind of um, established zones that eruptions are more likely to occur, but the individual pathways are probably having to be established over time, but they can be really long lived. So, for example, the Pu'u'u'u eruption, which was from 1983 to 2018, um, it happened in the same area on the flank. And so there was some kind of established, long lived established pathway between the summit magma storage chamber and then the um, the flank eruption where where that eruption was ongoing for you know 30 plus years. So. OK, a um, couple more questions. Um, any news on baby volcano forming offshore to east? Yes, so I didn't mention it, but we do have another active volcano, not technically in Hawaii because it's submarine and it used to be called Lo'ihi. It was renamed um, a few years ago to Kama'ehu a Kanaloa. And so that is, yeah, the youngest volcano. Um, it's still well under the the um, ocean surface. I, I don't recall off the top of my head, but um, we do see activity there occasionally. Um, there's been at least one earthquake swarm over the past several years. And then the most um, kind of most recent agreed upon eruption was probably in 1996 when there was a really intensive earthquake swarm and they did some um, submarine surveys that showed a, a crater formed and there were some new lava flows. So definitely something that we do try to keep an eye on using our, our instruments that are on the island here, um, but the, the, the um, so the seamount is, you know, obviously beneath the ocean surface, so we're kind of limited in, in how we can monitor it from the land here. Okay, yeah, and the last question we have for tonight is thank you for a very informative presentation. We learned a tremendous amount of information. Do you know what type of vegetation is first to establish for or reestablish after a lava flow event? Yeah, um, I think there's a native tree here called the Ohia, and I think they, it's kind of an initial colonizer, and then also ferns. Um, uh, but then also on, on a much smaller scale, I think there are lichen that uh, grow on the lava flows and start to break it down and make it a more hospitable environment for um, other plants to grow. So yeah, you might look at, at Ohia, Lehua is one of them, and then also um, maybe Kupu Kupu fern um, are a couple of them off the top of my head. <laughs> Okay, yeah, the other part of the question was when will this presentation be available so I can inform others? And the answer to that question is in about a week. <laughs> it should be available on 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 our on uh, on the um our video channel and on YouTube. But thank you again for talk tonight, Katie. It was very informative. Um I've been in a volcano nerd for years and years and years, and it was nice to I learned a few things I didn't know. So it was really nice. Oh, great. <laughs> um, and also thanks thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Again, this lecture will be available in about a week um, for viewing on our website at www.usgs.gov slash PLS. It's also available on our YouTube channel. You can also see many of our previous recordings on this website under the multimedia section for videos. We've been doing this for about 30 years now, so there's many, many lectures to look at. Um, if you would like to subscribe to be a part of our monthly mailing list, feel free to send us an email at wmcesic at usgs.gov, and we will happily add you to our list. Just a reminder that next month's public lecture will not occur until January, 
So enjoy your holiday season and come back and join us on Thursday, January 25th when Kathleen Springer and Jeff Bugatti will talk about evidence of humans in North America during the last glacial maximum. It should be an interesting talk. Hope to see you then. Good night.